trust you can hear me okay wired up with this microphone. Um, the technology work. Right. A little more about myself, just to give you a little more context. Um, I've actually changed my job title since I sent in my bi biography. I'm now known as Head of Science Information for the Natural Environment Research Council. But more crucially, I'm also um, Chair of the Research Council's UK Research Outputs Network. So I'm actually the person who leads within RCUK on issues around open access and open data. And some of you may, may be aware there's a large debate going on in the UK at the moment, at the moment about open access issues um, with, the, um, with the proposed policy from the Research Councils on Open Access and the debate of what's called the National Working Group on enhancing access to research publications. So I'm actually quite intimately involved in that level as well. However, today I'm going to be talking about research data and the importance of research data from a research funder's perspective. But one of the other hats I wear is also I'm a member of the Executive Committee of CoData, the International Council for Science Committee on Data for Science and Technology, who Again, you know, it is like the, the international coordinating group that deals with issues around data science. And again, they themselves, CoData ourselves, we're very interested in, in issues around open access to data. So I'm going to be coming at this from a perspective of someone who works within what's called Research Councils UK, which is the, the overarching coordinating body for the research funders in the United Kingdom. So there are seven research councils, those are those there, and we have a total research budget of round about four billion euros. Um, I haven't got, actually got last year's, this, this is a, from a couple of years ago, this figure. I wasn't able to check the other day what the, um, the, the total figure was at the moment. But it's, it's a fair amount of money, and we basically fund research within the UK academic sector mostly academic, but there is also funding goes into um, other institutes and now to some commercial organisations as well. So basically what I want to do is give something around a research funder's perspective on data, talk a little bit about why we value data, talk about some of the data policies we have in our research councils, and then I was asked to look a little bit into the future Interesting, some of the future things I was going to talk about, uh, Jo very kindly talked about in her earlier talk. So I'll, um, you know, some of this work about more enhanced, um, uh, richer publications. So I think I'll probably um, uh, sc scoot over some of what I was going to say in that area. So, data. Why are we interested in data? My research council, Natural Environment Research Council, funds research in the environmental sciences. Things like climate change, uh, water issues, water resources, biodiversity and such like. This little wordle shows we're interested in data information. This is actually developed from our, from our science information strategy within the organisation. It's just to show that all the research councils really see data as fundamental to the work they do both in terms of underpinning the research and helping deliver the exploitation of that research. So, first of all, what do we mean by data? Now, this is a definition of data from my own research council's data policy. Um, I should apologise at this point, I'm probably the world's worst person at using PowerPoint. So I tend to put up slides which have too many words on. So I don't expect to actually read all the words, it's just to show we have a definition of data. Now, other research councils have other definitions of data. And interestingly, um, there was a recent audit um, through our in audit service within the research councils looking at some of the work of um, our data centres across some of the councils. And one of their recommendations was we really must do something about coming up with a more standardised definition of what we mean by data. But what we're talking about here is basically the primary data produced by the research we fund. And it's not just digital data. It can be samples. I mean, as, as the previous speaker said, you know, it can, be, it can be sound clips, it can be pictures, it can be in environmental sciences, it can be analogue measurements, it can be fossil specimens, it can be samples of material. So when we talk about data, 
we have to think in the broadest context. Even though at times, a lot of a discussion tends to focus on what is digital about data, we have to remember quite often there is a long tail of other stuff which isn't just digital data. So, you know, for our, our, our example here, we also talk about the output from models. And that's quite crucial, say, if you work in the climate sciences, you know, where the model output itself can be actually quite a, a vast amount of da digital data, you know, what do we do with that? Is that a primary output of the research process? What about the models themselves? Are they classed as data? They're all part of the research process. I have no easy answers to some of these questions, but there's the sort of things you have to consider when you're thinking about policies to do with data. So why do we as research funders value data? Um, probably the two main reasons. The first one is the data are an integral part of the research record. So having access to the underlying data helps to support the robustness, the transparency, the integrity, and crucially, the richness of the research record. Um, certainly within the climate sciences, people may have come across a little controversy in the UK a couple of years ago called ClimateGate. Um, where um, there was a leak, an unauthorised leakage of emails from uh, the Climate Research Unit at the University of East Anglia. Now, um, I have my own opinion about that, which we won't go into, uh, given the partiality of some of the emails that were released, because I was actually funding some of the work going on behind the scenes to actually recreate data sets for public distribution. But there's an awful lot of researchers probably said there, but for the grace of God, go I. You know, what happens if someone comes to you and asks you for your research data as a researcher? Have you got it to hand? How are you set up to deal with requests that come under some things like freedom of information legislation? And this is all down, a lot of this is, our approach now is driven by what was called the transparency agenda. You know, the access, the transparency of research for transparency of government, which I'll come on to. <coughs> the other key reason why we value data is to enable it to be reused. It's what some people call data sharing, what I tend to call reuse and repurposing. Data sharing implies the data is just going to be used within the research community. It's going to be shared with other researchers. By reuse and repurposing, what we mean is it allows other people to do other stuff with the data. Now, that's not just research. And the crucial thing here, especially within the UK, now I'm not so familiar with maybe how the legislative environment sits in other parts of Europe, but certainly within the UK, a lot of a, the debate, uh, a lot of the government policy is about openness to government information. And by opening up this information, allowing other people to do stuff with that information, with that data, it therefore drives innovation. And through innovation, you drive growth. And through growth, you help drive economic benefit and prosperity. So what we're saying is, in the UK, you know, if we're opening a research data, it's not just for other researchers. It's to enable other people to do stuff with those data. Maybe what the research community hasn't even thought about. But there may be other benefits of using those data to drive innovation. And from, as I said, from innovation comes growth. So I mentioned. This, the government has this agenda about open data and transparency. And there is something called data.gov.uk, modelled somewhat on the data.gov uh, principles in, in the USA, um, about making public data freely and openly available for others to do stuff with. Now, that is also part of what's known as the, the sort of freedom of information legislation. Um, so in the UK, we have an, uh, um, at least two key pieces of legislation to do with freedom of access. One is our Freedom of Information Acts, Act, and the other is what's known as the Environmental Information Regulations, which is actually a European legislation uh, deriving from the Aarhus Convention. Um, and that is basically freedom of information for environmental information. But basically, if you're a researcher in the UK, in the university sector, basically, and apart from a few special cases, 
you are um, classed, uh, those data are classed as public data because universities are publicly funded institutions. Therefore, the data comes on under the auspices of the Freedom of Information Acts. Therefore, um, you, you have to be very careful when people request data because you're not at liberty just to say no. So if you're thinking about a data policy, one of the things you have to think about is how a data policy would fit in with your national legislation to do with uh, freedom of information. Of course, the majority of, of universities and research institutions will tend to be public institutions. Not all of them, but certainly from a UK context, a majority. So if we're developing policies, and I'm going to come on to describing policies in more detail, what instruments do we have as research funders to actually achieve our aims? Now, our aims are basically, as I said, you know, to ensure the openness and transparency and robustness of the research record and to enable other people to do stuff with the data generated through research. Well, the first thing is we can have a policy, and the policy basically says if you take our money, we expect you to do something. We expect you to do something in relationship to data. You know, so NSF has a policy and it says things around, well, we expect you to have a data management plan, which is going to tell you, tell people about how you propose to share your data with others. Um, if we fund you, you know, we can fund you to deliver stuff related to your data. So we can actually fund you to do data-specific activities. And also, as research funders, we can provide or we can support, through our funding mechanisms, actual data infrastructures themselves. So, um, again, Joe was talking about the work of the EBI. Um, you know, that is, some of that is funded you know, through Europe, and some of that is funded through the Wellcome Trust, which is a major charitable research funder in the UK. So that's where funders are stepping up and actually funding infrastructures for data. So, in terms of what are the data policies for the research councils in general? Um, well, basically, you know, data generated through research council funded research should by, should, by and large, be available for data sharing, for reuse. Though, and this is a very um, strong proviso, pr protections and constraints are in place. Now, I mentioned that we can be no less constraining than the freedom of information legislation allows, but freedom of information legislation doesn't mean you have to give everything away to everybody. So there, there are preventive protections there in place to cover issues, say, around consent and confidentiality in the medical and the social sciences. There are plenty of protections in place to cover inappropriate release of data, so you don't want to release the data too early, otherwise the researchers don't have a chance to publish their research uh, and, you know, and actually complete the research process. So and that, is, you know, that is not to seem to be in the public interest by damaging research. Therefore, there are protections in place to deal with that. But I think the key message is, when you're developing policies, you must realise you know, if you have to live within a freedom of information regime, if you're a public institution, you, you can be no more constrained than the legislation allows. So the key thing, it's not up to researchers now in the UK to say, I like that person, I'm going to share my data with that person, but I don't like that person, therefore I'm not going to share with them. If there's no legitimate reason not to share, in theory, they have to make their data available. So within the research councils, the basis of our policies is our, our common principles on data policy, and they are almost readable. Um, I do have a slide somewhere <laughs> which explains what they are in more detail. But they're the basically principles that data are a public good. They should be made openly accessible to others, but they shouldn't be inappropriately released. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's legitimate to use public funds in their management, etc. Um, the URL is there. I, I won't go into too much detail, but it's, it's basically to say we have a set of principles we've developed. They themselves were 
were, were developed from the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation Development, has a set of guidelines on, I'm trying to think of what they're called, um, principles on uh, public access to publicly funded research data. For my sins, I should know, as I was one of the authors of those prin OECD principles as well. But it's to say, you know, we are seven research councils, but we have a set of common policy principles which underpin all our policies on, on access to data. Another driver, which I've already mentioned, is this issue of research integrity. You know, one of the drivers for us is to ensure the, re the research we publish is as robust as possible. And part of that quest for robustness is being able to access, for other people to be able to access the underlying data, the data behind the graph, so to speak. Now, as I, as I mentioned, there's currently, there's been a, um, a draft policy from the research councils on um, their new position on open access, which is available, it's still on the web for people who want to see it, but basically it says that research papers must include a statement now on how the underlying research materials, sort of data and samples and materials, uh, can be accessed. Some uh, research councils, my own included, already has a policy statement to that effect, but not all research councils do. So again, this is another driver for us to get researchers to think quite carefully about how they deal with their data and crucially how the research institutions also deal with these issues. Another area, another driver for policies around research data is research, uh, basically it's, it's codes of practice on research behaviour. Uh, we have in research councils, we have our policy on the conduct and governance of good research practice. Many research funders have these policies about how you should undertake research activities. And this is just pulled out of the RCUK um, code of practice. So it notes that unacceptable conduct includes, um, you know, a mismanagement of the underlying data. And there's a there's basically, it is unacceptable if you don't make the relevant primary data and research evidence access, accessible to others for a reasonable period after the research is published. And we say by default, round about 10 years or so, but for major projects, especially, you know, of um, say medical or environmental impact where policy decisions are based on that, so government policy decisions, we expect a longer period. So it, it's basically saying, you know, we as research funders, this is what, how we expect you to undertake your research. So these requirements both talk to the individual researcher, they also talk to the researcher's institution as well, and the responsibilities that will fall upon a research institution. Now I'm going to look at the policies of two individual councils, my own, Natural Environment Research Council, and the um, Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. Um, the reason I've chosen these two is to some extent they're at different ends of a spectrum. NERC, along with the Economic and Social Research Councils, has a data policy in place now for over 20 years. Whereas EPSRC basically, I think it was last year, basically implemented their data policy. So they've come to the game fairly late with a formal data policy. But they've had the opportunity of seeing how others have done it. And they've actually done it quite differently to some extent. And um, actually, if I was starting again, I would look very seriously at, at this policy because EPSRC puts their onus on the research institution and speaks to the research institutions that they fund and say, right, you're the people who are you know, responsible for the research teams. The research is going out under your name as an institution that's done the work. We expect you as an institution to take the main responsibility for issues around data and to have that responsibility for the long-term management of data uh, beyond the end of one project or, or program. Um, now, this is sort of one end of a spectrum of, of how we can think about responsibilities. Whereas NERC, 
um, and this is what NERC's policy is about, very much places the onus of responsibility on the researcher and says it's the researcher's responsibility to do stuff with data. So we have a policy, you know, which, and why we as a researcher, and again, this sort of tries to explain why we as a research funder have a policy, but it's, it's to ensure the environmental data that's collected under our funding are really available for anyone to use in the longer term. And to also, crucially, a second point, to help um, in the form of publication of data, which we're going to look at as well, coming on to, and to meet legislation. But our policy very much sits, the responsibilities tend to sit on the PI. And I think if I was writing this policy again, I would I'd actually say, well, actually, some of that responsibility has to be shared by the institution. By default, it tends to become an institutional activity, but we're less specific about saying it is up to the institution to do it. So that's something to consider as organisations develop their policies. How much is the responsibility of an individual and how much is the responsibility of the institution they work for? Now, our policy within NERC, our key principles are that um, we will support the long-term management of data, but we will make those openly and freely. And by free, we mean available for free to anyone to do anything with. So very much driven by this agenda of reuse, repurposing, exploitation. And crucially, we'll make the stuff available for anyone for free, apart from very few special cases where, for example, the data sets we hold contain data which is provided by a third party. Um, so if it's a data set, say, which contains a, a topographic map or something within it, those are produced by another, uh, the Ordnance Survey in the UK, and they are quite tightly controlled in, in terms of intellectual property. But m the majority of the data we hold, we will make available for free for anyone to do anything with. But we also require that anyone we fund offers back to us copies of the data they collect, which we will then manage and disseminate through our own network of data centres. So I've been talking about NERC, I've been talking about EPSRC. So there are differences in policies across the research funders. And these tend to be based in terms of discipline differences. A good example here is the, the medical sciences. You know, consent and confidentiality issues mean it's much more... Um, tricky, well, not, it, you have to take more issues into consideration if you want to share and make available data which is about human subjects, because there are all issues around consent and um, informed consent about uh, being able, wanting your data shared, as opposed to data just collected about the environment, we tend to make a lot more freely available. So there are disciplinary, an access of disciplinary differences which will inform a policy. Um, I've talked about this access of responsibility, you know, one of them is to do with the individual as opposed to institution, where do those responsibilities lie? And then a third axis to think about in terms of a data policy is where is the infrastructure coming from to manage the data? Is it very much just an institutional level, like we were hearing earlier about the facilities being set up at Cornell, or is it via a centrally funded provision as, for example, my research council or the Economic and Social Research Council make available central data management facilities. And also in terms of how you can actually access funds to support data management activities. And here you have to be quite clear, if we're developing policies, between um, those activities that take place within a project and those activities that take place beyond the end of any one project or programme. So within a project, by and large, from our perspective in the research councils, you must bid for the resources you need. So if you're going to need a bioinformatician, an informatician in your project to help deliver data management activities, you have to make sure you bid for the money to pay for that person. However, post-project data management, from my research council, will provide a central facility, so you don't need to fund for those activities. However, another institution may require that 
you must you must you know you to support their infrastructure you're going to have to have a certain amount of overhead within any grant application to put in for long-term funding of any infrastructure to deliver long-term data management so again this is a, a key policy difference which varies across funders in terms of how their perspective on supporting research infrastructures is um, so as I, I talked about EPSRC they very much say it's responsibility of institution and that money must come from grants within projects or from block grants or from the money received from the funding councils etc whereas NERC we provide seven environmental data centers um, which we fund for the long term to manage the data that our research generates we can do this to some extent because we have our network of our own research centres, our own wholly owned research centres, which are part of the UK's national infrastructure in environmental research. So as we have a long-term commitment to supporting our own research infrastructures, part of that is providing data management infrastructures within that. And on top of that, we then provide a, a data discovery service, a data catalogue service, which allows you to look across all the data we hold and to search it as a seamless whole. And we are moving more towards trying to deliver a more integrated approach to the data. So as a user, you don't have to know which of our seven data centres stuff is held in. We're trying to come up with a in a technical phrase, a more common web services based architecture where we'll provide a standard service layer of web services and other people can build their services on top and dip into our data. But the great thing about that is it means that people who may want to innovate, say, in commercial activities, but they want some environmental data, can dip into our services to pull data out and mash it up with data from somewhere else. We're also talking to the social scientists and the people in medical science about how could we extend this model more widely to research data so that we can start to make it easier for people to do more cross-cutting, cross-disciplinary research by pulling data from discipline areas out using the same um, protocols you know, through a set of common service layers. So this is still very much you know, future thinking, but if, we, you know, if institutions are holding research data, we've got to get it out there and get it used. It's pointless just holding and managing stuff if we're not making it available for other people to use. Now, in terms of how we actually go about implementing our policies, too often, you know, I just people hear people say, well, it's all to do with carrots and sticks. And as I say, give me a big enough carrot and I'll hit someone with it. Um, Basically, we, we have to really, as research funders, recognise we can't just implement policies from on high. It's pointless just saying, well, we've got a policy, go away and do it. Um, I think it may be argued in the US, so NSF have developed their data management policy, but they've been fairly light on how they're going to actually make sure it, it happens. Um, you might want to comment about that afterwards. Um, yeah. Whereas we're certainly with our research council, we're saying, well, actually, if we're going to have a policy, it's pointless having a policy if we can't make it work. So we're finding ways to um, incentivize people to get them to do stuff. We're also looking at ways of um, of um, uh, monitoring their performance, so to speak, and and to to censor them if they don't um, don't do the right things. And we have a project at the moment called PIP our policy implementation project to implement our data policy in full as our new data policy came into force a couple of years ago and we're still actively going through processes to make it a living activity within our research community um, and what we're going to be asking for is both outline and full data management plans so if you're putting in a grant proposal we want to see you've done a little bit of thinking about data nothing major you know it's like a paragraph or so in the case of support but the sort of things we want to know about is well what data of long-term value do you really think you're going to generate you know when do you think you're going to have these available you know and crucially who is the person who's going to be responsible for the data issues during the research activity 
it's basically to show that the researchers at least engaged with some of the data issues while they're thinking about putting their science proposal together rather than coming at data as an add-on almost as the science is finishing saying oh we better do something about meeting the data policy now now if you're actually funded we expect you to produce a full data management plan within about three months or so of getting your award letter. And that will be a collaborative activity between yourself and our own research centres. And that full plan is very much the contract between the, the principal investigator, the PI, and one of our data centres. And it will outline the key things you're going to do in terms of data, you know, the who, the what, data the where you know who's going to do it where is it going to be done and crucially when's it going to be done and also says what data of long-term value you tend to deposit you intend to deposit with the data center now this picks up again on one of the issues that joe raised in her talk about we can't manage everything forever so how do we start to make those decisions about what data we're going to keep, <laughs> what we're going to throw away? What we say is we will take on board data of long-term value and we'll guarantee to keep those in our, in our data centres. So we're developing this concept of what we call our data value checklist. Um, it's trying to quantify, working with the research community, how we identify data which we should keep and how we should identify stuff which it's less useful to hang on to and can be thrown away. Um, as one of our previous chief executives used to say, well, if it's stuff to do with goldfish physiology, I think we can throw that away because all we can do is just put another goldfish in a liquidizer kind of thing. But um, joking aside, this, this has actually proved, it was a nice idea, but it's actually proven to be quite a difficult concept to actually formally write down how do I identify data. Uh, which we want to keep. We, we have a working version, we're still consulting on it, but it's not an easy answer to give. But crucially, our management, you know, that, my chief executive, wants to know he hasn't signed a blank check to, um, you know, to commit to managing the whole corpus of data generated through NERC research, as it would basically, it would probably bankrupt us at the end of the day. So, very briefly, as my time is rapidly running out, what sort of, where are we going to go in the future? Um, I think we've been talking about data publication, and that's one way of incentivizing researchers through being able to formally publish data sets, um, through the issuing of DOIs for data sets, digital object identifiers. We now have that facility within NERC to issue DOIs through DataSite. Uh, Sarah Callahan, one of my colleagues, is here, and maybe you want to talk to her informally if Sarah waves her arm around, um, who's lead, who's a project manager working for me on our data citation activities. Um, there's the role of publishers, actually, in producing much richer publications, and we've talked about some of the work EBI is doing, but also we shouldn't forget about the things that commercial publishers can do and commercial publishers may be able to deliver in this era. Um, I think, crucially, we have to clarify the role of what data centres like what my research council funds, which very much have that long-term vision of managing data for reuse and the role of repositories in managing data because if all repositories become a ways of putting data into a secure box which you never then open the lid off apart from in extreme circumstances is that going to be useful to anybody another data that is there is one thing but as i said if we're managing these data we really need to get them out there and used by other people and finally under codata's banner we're thinking about something called the agenda for data which is to talk to, a talk to the really large-scale international programs of research and trying to get them to adopt very much common principles around data. So as these big international programs like the World Climate, uh, World Climate Research Programme and, and the new ICSU Programme on Global Change, which is just starting up, uh, the Future Earth Programme, trying to get them to come up with a set of common prin principles around data which articulate the value of data and clearly explain, if you're going to be doing this global scale science, these are the things you must do in terms of data. And I'll leave it there. Thank you.